um, participation in community life and connection with the congregation, the pursuit of breadth and depth of knowledge about Unitarian Universalism, and a demonstration of a commitment to the mission of FUS and concern for the needs of the whole congregation. Um, for these roles that take on the responsibility to act on behalf of the congregation, we especially look for members who approach differences of opinion with curiosity, who work well in a collaborative environment, and who show appreciation for the contributions of others. So in addition to conversations, we also ask nominees to complete a written survey to describe their interest and qualifications on their own behalf. Um, if anyone has any questions about the work of the nominations committee, or if you would like to find out more about serving in one of these roles in the future, um, please speak to any member of the committee. So Alyssa or myself, um, and currently on the committee is also Becky Burns, who is here, uh, and Susan Koenig, who I think I saw on Zoom. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, one thing that I'll also briefly mention here is um, if you have an interest in deepening your, your connection and, and leadership within at the US, please take a look at the information about the Pathways program that'll be coming um, this fall. So you can look in the red floors for information on that. Great, then we will move on to our um, slate of nominees for each of the groups that we have today. Um, like Jenny very clearly laid out, we'll take a, a motion in a second and then call for discussion and then a vote. Yes, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. It's already there. All right. So Maureen Muldoon has already enthusiastically had a motion to support um, Maureen is our nominee for our um, Board of Trustees president for the coming year. Um, so we have a motion from Rob. Do we have a second? Vicki? Vicki Jones? Okay. Any discussion? Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. And any abstentions? All right. Maureen Muldoon is our new Board of Trustees president. <laughs> president. President-elect, I forgot to say. So she'll be president-elect for one year and then board president for two years after that. Wonderful. Um, then Ann Schaefer is our nominee for board of trustees for a second term. She's served three years and is now onto her second three-year term. Is there a motion to nominate Ann? Lorna Aronson. <laughs> and Paula enthusiastically second. <laughs> Um, it typically it varies, but it, there's a two term maximum. Some, some people roll off after one term and some serve the full two terms. Yes. Yep. You got it. Any discussion? Then all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? All right. Ann Schaefer is once again representing us on the board. Thanks, Ann. All right. And Emily Smith um, is our nominee for the new board secretary. So she is already on the board and we're approving her for a one-year term as secretary. So motion to approve Emily. Aaron, pause, good. And a second? Oh, 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 I saw Anne smile. <laughs> Love the enthusiasm of trying to move and second these nominees. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. And any abstentions? Great, thank you. And Emily Smith is our new secretary. And our last one for board is a very enthusiastic group of youth who have completed the coming of age class. Um, we uh, have two official board positions for youth on our board, um, but we 
really would like interested youth to be able to participate if they want to. And these are non-voting um, positions on the board. And of course, our board meetings are open, so anybody could attend anyway. So we have two youth liaisons as well that um, are, and, and I'll, I'll just say the youth members of our board, um, not only does it give them a really great um, background of, of how things work at FUS in our congregation to prepare them for potential leadership um, as members when they're adults, um, but really any congregation, and, and I would say community and nonprofit organizations too, and just being more engaged in our community. So, um, but, but beyond that, <laughs> they provide a lot of really great insight in, to the board as well. So it's really um, a, a great situation for everybody to hear their voices in the room. So this year we have um, Mason Shadle, who's um, a nominee for a second one-year term. So the youth serve one-year terms. Um, Asha Harold, Maisie Shaw, and Nolan Hicks are our new youth board members. Can I get a motion to approve? Dorit. So moved. So moved. Sandy, second. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, aye. say nay. Abstentions? Great. There's our four new youth board members we'll welcome. Okay, and then um, we also have our nominations committee, which is voted on by the parish. So we have Emily Cusick Putnam, who is going to be on, uh, who is our nominee for nominations committee, and Sam First um, as two new additions to the nominations committee um, to 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 help with this work, basically. <laughs> so a motion to approve those. All right, go ahead. Oh, oh, yeah. Claire, Claire Box. In a second? All right, okay, good. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Great. Thank you, Emily and Sam. All right, and lastly, our FUS Foundation Board um, has three members who are renewing their three-year terms. Um, Connie Beam, Annette Helmer, and David Kenzie are all um, being nominated um, for continuing terms on the board. Motion to approve the nominees. Yep. All right. In a second. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? All right. Thank you, everyone. We have our new slate of board, foundation, and nominee. Thank you, Alyssa and Terry, and thank you to everyone who is stepping up to, to take those roles. It's so exciting to see so many people wanting to be active and especially the youth it's just it's such a pleasure to have the youth and the board and see that energy so very exciting so now we're going to move on to our 24 25 budget um and when i was looking at that meeting in 2020 so four years ago when we were all virtual it's kind of amazing to see all that we've gone through since then and how far we've come because we were clearly going into a time of not being together and being mostly or all virtual for a time we were starting the ministerial search at that time and since then we have gone through the search we have a co-ministry model we have we're back together again and re in person and we have a new mission and vision so it's kind of exciting to see all that where we are now and all that we've come through together and this past year has been challenging but i i feel very optimistic and I feel good where we are. So I wanted to give just a little bit of background before we look at the budget. And I won't drain all this because I know some of you have been to many meetings where we talked about some of this site, so but I do want to give some background to tell you about how we got where we are now. And for those of you who maybe weren't able to attend the, the various meetings we had earlier this year. So in those last several years since we had the pandemic and the economic downturn, we relied 
very heavily on government funding, first of all, which was a blessing that we had that. So we relied heavily on government funding and then also relied on our reserves to balance our budget for several years. So we don't have that government funding and our reserves have been pretty much depleted. And then last year, if you recall, we had no cost of living increases for our staff um, to balance the budget. So this year, Kelly and Kelly and Monica back in fall um, began to realize that this coming year was going to be a challenge, that we were going to have a challenge to balance the budget. And so they actually started talking about the budget and talking with the board very early. Usually it's something we start really digging into and bringing to you in spring. And we brought... Um, we began that process early, and another factor, of course, was that Kelly Crocker was going on a very well-deserved sabbatical, so we wanted to make sure that we were, you know, involving her in, in the process, using all of her wisdom. So the process was, was early, and, you know, things, some things have changed since our very first um, proposals. So we had an initial budget that we introduced in January 2024, and it was about 200,000 less than last year. And you can see um, when you look at the budget in your packet there. And uh, we had three town halls. One of them was virtual, a lot of great conversation. And then we also had our financial forum. And then we had, you know, we had a lot of good conversations uh, through some further discernment that Kelly did and kind of looking deeply into the positions and what we had ahead of us. And then also some increases in expected income for next year. We have changed that proposed budget and communicated to you about that proposed budget. Uh, maybe, was that in April? Maybe late April-ish. So our Revised budget is still less than last year. We still have those challenges we had, but it is about 150,000 less than last year now. And we recognize we're still making cuts to staff, and we recognize that that's painful and not a position we wish we were in. We wish we had more money than we knew what to do with, but that's the position we're in, and it is, we do feel it is necessary and uh, how to get us into a sustainable position. Our reserves are still low, uh, but we now are in a better position. We are beginning to replenish them, and we're in a better position to replenish them going forward. So I, I and the board, we all feel very happy with where we are now, um, all things considered, and feel optimistic. So um, just a little bit of background there without going over everything we did before. So I think we can go ahead and put the budget up on the screen here, and it's also in your packet again. And we've highlighted the changes from the budget that we introduced in January. So the first column is the categories, and then we have our proposed budget. We usually do our budget in a two-year average of our actual, so that one year doesn't really throw things off. That's been trickier in the last several years since you know things are just up and down, things change. So we use that a little more as guidance, but had to make some judgments. So the second year, just for your information and comparison, is a two-year average of actuals and how things uh, uh, relate to that or contrast, and then the variance. And then the approved 23-24 budget is the second column from the right, second farthest column. So you can see how we've come down from there. Um, and then the variance. So our, a couple of things that are higher is our rental income, the parking especially. We're very lucky to have a, a parking spot in such a desirable location. Also a very large donation to our foundation that was really a blessing. Um, so those are a couple places where our income is higher. Uh, also, we made a, a request or a, you know, a ask to those members to give where they felt called to support our music program um, to be able to retain some of those positions. We've reduced a leadership development um, 
category here. And then also reduced our, our partial replenishing of our cash reserve is another area where we balance that budget. So Kelly, anything you want to say before we get into the motion? Just to anticipate one question, because it's I know people have asked me about it in advance of this meeting, so maybe it's a question that will come up here. Uh, as Jenny said, um, is in part of the the revised budget plan that the board shared with you about a month and a half ago, that included a special ask to members of the congregation who both have the means and the will, uh, who wanted to specifically help ensure the uh, the the to secure the music staff at their current level for this year uh, to make a special gift towards that purpose. Several people had already said, I want to do that, please take my money. We said, okay, we will, we will be happy to take your money. So the uh, question I've already received is, how do we do? Right? And the answer is, we have successfully raised commitments in excess of the original goal. So my many deep thanks to those of you who have those of you who have uh, joined me in making uh, additional pledge of support specific to the music program for next year, um, just want to give you that information. So the goal was twenty thousand um, dollars. I don't have the because we haven't closed the giving window in any sense. I don't have the exact number, but we have definitely exceeded it. I believe at this moment actually doubled it. Okay, can you advance the slide and we can come back to it. So can I have a motion to approve the budget? Okay, and a second? A second? Okay, so we have a first and a second. Now we are gonna take any discussion questions before we take a vote and um, we have a couple folks. Chuck and Ann, you guys are gonna help with the mic passing. All right, I'm gonna go grab someone. Hello, can you hear me? Good. Um, Kelly, you successfully anticipated the first part of my question. Thank you. <laughs> my second part of that question is um, how we're doing on the pledge campaign. Um, and I guess what, what happens if we've successfully fundraised for these specific purposes, but then fall short of our pledge goal? Uh, so I would describe the state of our pledge campaign is good. Um, uh, I think I can say it's a little ahead of where it was last year at this time. The way that our pledge campaign works, and I don't, I'm not trying to defend this as being intuitive because it's not to me. It's the system that we have here. It could have changed over time, but it is the way we've been doing it and the way we're doing it again this year. Uh, the campaign is permanently rolling, really, and uh, so when we supply numbers for the budget, it is an estimate. It is not based, strictly speaking, on pledges, on, uh, based on being limited only on pledges in hand. It's an estimate based on a rolling average of the pledges that we do did ultimately receive for the last two years. Um, so we're in a, pla a positive place relative to where we were last year in terms of pledge commitments for this coming year. To answer the question, you know, what happens if ultimately we fall short, that is, a, that is always a possibility, right? Because we are budgeting based on a prediction of pledges, and not only could that pledging prediction be incorrect, um, it has been, although usually not enough that it has been a really significant consideration, uh, not only could the, the estimate of pledges be incorrect, but then ultimately the estimate of how much of those pledges get paid could also be incorrect. We, we do uh, partially prorate uh, that. We don't count on every single dollar of every single pledge that we estimate coming in. We actually, this is a point of, I think we should be proud of, we have a very high pledge payment rate 
as a congregation, like way higher than any previous congregation I have worked for or been a part of. Um, and so like that's a really, that's a really positive quality, right? But it's also not a guarantee because there's no such thing as a guarantee in a set of predictions like this. So ultimately the answer is because the budget depends on predictions, this is the largest single one of them, but there are several others, right? Predictions about revenue in a couple of different areas, uh, doesn't anticipate massive natural disasters, other, you know, catastrophic uh, changes in circumstances. There is always the possibility of us coming up short and even substantially short. Uh, the answer is that is first and foremost the responsibility of your staff team led by Kelly and myself to resolve in the places where we can. And there is sometimes a little bit of tap dancing end of the year, you know, we're over in this area, we're under in this area. Can we make these two things come together? Uh, and also honoring, of course, all of the restrictions on, where there are restrict, like most people pledge unrestricted money to the congregation, but there are also people who give restricted gifts that have some controls on them. So even if we're over in this area and we're under in that area, we can't move money that is promised to one area to another area. That doesn't work. So all of making all of that line up is a big part of your staff team's role. If we were to encounter a scenario where we felt, Kelly and I and the team we lead, felt we can't resolve this. There is enough of a disruption, enough of a deviation from expectations for whatever reason. We cannot make the budget work despite it's having been approved because there's something that we didn't anticipate about it. Uh, we would come to the congregation, come to the board first and the then with the board we would come to the congregation about that. Uh, I am grateful that we really haven't had to do that uh, in my fairly brief time here. Um, and we do our best to submit a budget that we are optimistic we will not have to do that about. But I don't want to promise something that is not a truly keepable promise without the ability to predict the future. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll take an online question next. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Franz and Eleni, if you want to unmute and then you can ask your question or give your feedback. Um, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, um, so I know that we had to cut staff, which sucks, but did cutting staff allow us to give any pay increases to the staff that were retained or are we still putting that off? Thanks for your question. Um, yes, that was a part of it. And well, Kelly, we might be able to answer more correctly. So it was a, a big part of it, a smaller, you know, we came, we're coming to a smaller staff that's more fairly paid. So we're now able to achieve the, um, I don't know exactly, Kelly, what it is, the like average of the UUA salary guidelines for all of our staff. And we're really proud that we're able to do that. And I do agree, it's a bummer. I'll use different words, but it's a bummer to have to cut staff very much. I, I want to clarify that because it's I, I think it's a positive move, and I also don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about it, right? So let me, let me try and give you as, as clean, a relatively complicated explanation as I can. Uh, some years ago, I believe it was during the interim period, it's before my time, but only a little bit before my time, uh, the board committed to moving into a, relation, a, a right relationship with the um, salary guidelines that are provided to us by the Unitarian Universalist Association. The Office of Church Finance supplies guidance to our membership. Guidance that's totally up to us whether we follow or not. They have no control over our behavior. But the board said we want to intentionally move towards being uh, following the practice of fair compensation as uh, guided by the UUA's schema. I mean, there's still a bunch of areas of um, subjectivity within them. They're not just, it's not just like, okay, and that's the number. It's like, no, okay, here's a range. And it depends a little bit on how you assess what this person's job is. Like, does it match this description better or that description? Anyway, we made that commitment. The congregation moved into actually getting uh, people to the at least the baseline of their sort of target range. Uh, incredible accomplishment. Really proud of, you did it before I got here. So I'm like, just really grateful and proud of the congregation for doing that. Uh, and then, I think literally the next year, 
the entire system of staff compensation guidance for congregations uh, changed. It was dramatically overhauled. Some of you are aware of this because uh, the previous version was completely open source. You could, anybody could go to a public website and see all of the information about it. Now it is accessible. It is not restricted. Like you should be, if you really want to, you should be able to go check it out, but you have to, uh, basically commit to a little bit of like education about how it works in order to get access to it. So I, unfortunately, I'm not able to just hand someone a link and say, here, go check it out for yourself, now develop your own opinion about it. It's quite the same way as we used to be able to. But another change besides that sort of visibility change uh, is that it pretty dramatically increased the, uh, the guidance for compensation in several but not all areas of professional church workers, um, which is great. I, I, I commend them on that. That is wonderful. It also means that we went from being finally able to say we are fully uh, on board and now uh, but we lost a lot of ground because it got overhauled. It gets overhauled periodically anyways. It's always going to happen, but it was just an unusually large jump. So. Here is the deal for next year. Uh, Kelly and I are not taking any, there's no pay increase for us in this budget. Uh, we are already the best compensated members of the staff. We are also already within the, uh, the range, right? We're, all, it's, we're, not, we're not officially underpaid by this guidance. So we don't, that's great, we're okay. Uh, several staff, are and everybody who is is making uh, movement in some cases significant movement towards uh, fair compensation um, some of the staff positions are closer than others some of the staff positions are already there some of them still have more to go but everybody who is underpaid for their job description is making substantial progress in this budget Uh, my name is Barb Avery. I have a request and then I also have a comment. My request is that you review the differences between the first proposed budget and the second for staffing so that everybody understands where we've moved from that first proposal to this one. And my comment is, as much as I respect the people who are supporting uh, extra money into the music program, I think it's an extremely bad precedent to do that sort of thing and um, allow contributions to specific budget lines in an operating budget. It's an extremely bad precedent. And um, I, you know, I, I can envision all kinds of infighting and well, I don't wanna give my money to that, I wanna give my money to this. But in addition to that, allowing this year's situation to be resolved in part by that mechanism puts us in a position of next year facing exactly the same problem. And the bright side of this that I can see is, okay, fine, then we need to spend the rest of the, the next 12 months figuring out how we don't end up back in this situation next year. And it cannot, please do not make the solution be to invite or accept contributions to specific operating budget lines. Thanks. Thank you for your for your comment. Um, so I'll, I'll on the staff. So the change was that there were going to be two reduced to half time, which is the music director and the what was the director of stewardship director is the position title, which was the new title. Both of those will be now full time rather than half time. And then there was a new uh, net new role of office assistant, which will be half time instead of the full time. Anything I missed or? And I appreciate your comment. It's something we've certainly struggled with. Um, and there's no, no perfect answers. I, I wish there were, and it's, I agree. It's something we struggled with, but it seemed like the best solution. This is, a, I think, the best solution that we're bringing to you, but I, I really understand and respect what you're saying.
Hello, my name is Carol Ferguson, and um, following uh, Kelly's report that we have with a special collection for um, the music and the stewardship positions, I, I, uh, there's extra money now, and um, I, I feel really concerned that we don't have a paid social justice person that we have that the budget has excluded or has uh, closed that position down. Um, and I know this church is known a lot for its music. I wish it were known better for its social justice action in the community. Um, so it's probably late in the game, but to make a suggestion that if there is extra money that it be used to fund that position. Uh, my name is Carolyn Sanders. Um, my question about the donations for the music program, were those a one, was that a one-year pledge? Uh, are we gonna be facing the same thing next year or in the coming years with raising money to make that a full-time position? Uh, so, uh, yes, the, in terms of what the commitment has been from the donors, it's a one-time commitment, absolutely. No, uh, I mean, or someone could turn around and say, yes, I wanna keep giving this in perpetuity, but that was not the ask and that's not our, our understanding with the donors. Um, this a little bit actually gets to addressing Barb's comment, which I respect as a comment, uh, so, but since, it, since you're asking, basically, so, you know, for, for clarity and, and transparency, right, uh, the way that the revision to the budget plan happened is that I thought, hmm, I don't think we can, I, I'm concerned about my ability to make this work with the staff team that we have. So I first went to Kelly Crocker, although she is on sabbatical, we talk about things where her opinion is needed, her input is needed, uh, whether she's on sabbatical or not. Uh, we So we talked about it, we agreed, okay, uh, if we can make uh, this change in the budget for next year, it will put us in a much better position basically to be successful. Um, I mean, I can get into further if, with, it, uh, with the thinking behind it if you want. Um, but it's really not worth doing. It's actually really just kicking the can down the road if we're gonna have to come back again and keep asking. So the plan that ultimately we worked out with the board, right, and that the board brought to you and that is now before you, this is the, this is the budget that you have to vote on, uh, is with the anticipation that this is a one-time thing. Doesn't mean that, I mean, again, I cannot predict the future, but it is undertaken with the, the intention and expectation that making next year's budget line up and line up with, with the same staff, right, Neither that there will need to be more cuts, nor that there will need to be more one-time, subject-specific I'll disappear out onto the front court. I've got, I'm leaving, I think, in about 10 minutes. So I'll yell when I'm done there talking about the budget right now. Hi. Um, I have a question about the... Uh, the uh, campaign, capital campaign donations. Uh, do we have an upcoming campaign or an ongoing campaign? And uh, what are these donations targeted towards? So we are expecting an upcoming capital campaign. Um, we'll start thinking about that in fall and figuring out what that would look like, but we're about due to have our next one. Um, do you want to have any more specifics you want to add? Kelly? I, I would basically just affirm what Jenny is saying. We, in, we are planning on having a capital campaign in the fall. No definitive decision for how to, you know, label. Uh, the, in planning that campaign, we'll need to do things like say what are the primary things that we are raising this money for. I mean, I can give you my list, but it's not a list that ultimately has been approved by the board yet, who are the people who would. So uh, we are committed to doing it. 
we are not yet committed to exactly what it will be for. We actually have received a couple of gifts for the campaign, agnostic of what it is ultimately for and about. Thank you to those generous donors. Um, but you'll be hearing more about this when there is more to hear about it in the fall. Let's hear it for agnostic. <laughs> I think we have a question online. March Schweitzer, if you want to unmute. Hi, um, so I, I'm uh, interested in finding out what is going to happen to the duties of the communications director, which is the position that I believe was eliminated um, in terms of taking care of the website and uh, making sure that the news from the red floors is uh, done properly. Who's going to be taking over those not insignificant responsibilities. Uh, yes, not insignificant at all, very significant. Uh, so in the original plan, original plan, uh, a plan from January, let's say, uh, a large percentage, maybe as much as half of those responsibilities were going to the new office assistant position. Nothing like as much work could be expected, uh, um, especially because the office assistant position has other responsibilities that we recognized we needed to have a staff member for, um, but that some of those would be going to that position. With the current plan, the plan that you are actually here to vote on today, uh, that office assistant position is only half time. So even less of the responsibilities specific to the current uh, communications position uh, can be anticipated to move to that area of responsibility. Uh, basically, pretty much the red floors. That's essentially the, the main thing that is transferring, making sure that the red floors get out each week. Uh, probably actually with less, mm, with, with greater expectation from other staff because so much of the material in the red floors is actually generated by various members of the staff team and that it needs one person to compile it and be responsible for sort of the tending of that information product. Uh, so that's the answer about the red floors. Uh, the answer about the website is that some of the, well, a lot of the website responsibilities are being distributed across the staff team. That was essentially part of the, the strategic bargain that was made in the readjustments that uh, allowed us to keep two of positions full-time rather than going to half-time, but then also had to have uh, the new office assistant position go to half-time. That meant redistributing uh, some areas of work responsibility across the staff team, mostly the director level positions um, and the ministers, of course. Uh, so that's the plan and the answer uh, for the website. Um, in terms of where the buck's gonna stop, it's gonna stop with me most things ultimately do stop with Kelly or myself or both of us uh, in terms of the staff responsibilities. Um, I will be transparent and say it's a challenging strategy that we have embarked upon. It's because, in my opinion, the alternative was dramatically more challenging and I felt much, much, much less likely to succeed. Uh, but I'm gonna be, uh, we are gonna be also enlisting more volunteer uh, support in a variety of areas, some of them communications related, some of them in other areas of the church, over the coming years, both because that's something we've been saying we need to do more of anyways, enlist more volunteer efforts in areas crucial to the functioning and the life of the congregation, and also because our economic reality means that we don't have a choice in making that shift. Hi. Um... I want to start by just saying that I'm really happy to see this budget um, is, oh, I'm Rudy. Sorry, Rudy Moore. Um, I, uh, I normally want to do the whole UU introduction at this moment, but um, anyway, um, <laughs> I would just want to say I'm really glad that it lives within its means, and I'm really glad to see increases for the staff in terms of income from year over year. 
especially after the inflationary period that we went through. I've got three questions, two really short ones, hopefully, and one more open-ended. The first one is a clarification. Most people have already, there's been a number of people that have already asked pieces of these questions already, um, but a clarification on that uh, staff increase. So we're getting closer to the UUA standards, great, um, and meeting them for certain congregations that are a little smaller than we actually are, but okay. Um, but do we keep up with the actual cost of living increase, the inflation rate, um, or are we below the inflation rate for at least the last year anyway? I think very candidly, I don't have the inflation rate in my head. It's not a, it's not, because we are, sorry, I should stand to say this, uh, because we are focused on working towards the fair compensation guidelines, uh, we didn't spot check against inflation because it wouldn't, we made the most progress we possibly could, right? Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't adjust up or down and it's, it is truthfully like I just don't have, I haven't done the math in that area to answer the question. Does that, I, yeah. I apologize for that. No, I appreciate even that answer for okay. sure. Um, the second question then is about uh, the rental increases because we're getting a, a fair amount of increase through our increased rents that we're hoping for. Um, have, I think the two main renters are Meeting House Nursery School and our parking um, as a conglomerate. Um, is the Meeting House Nursery School uh, rental closed, as in it's gonna happen? And the second part is, do we think that the change in parking situation with that giant new um, parking structure and change in construction projects, is that going to uh, be sufficient to truly meet those numbers? So we have three primary sources of rental income. Parking, uh, Meeting House Nursery School, and Congregation Shrey Shemayim, the Reconstructionist Synagogue with whom we share this building. Uh, those are all very positive relationships and they do see a substantial amount of income for the congregation. Uh, in terms of parking, we have so many people beating down the door to rent parking spaces from us that um, Tom struggles even to like appease people with a, uh, sorry, Tom Miskelly, our facilities manager, who is in charge of that, uh, struggles to even uh, sort of appease people with having a waiting list. Like it's just, it's bananas how in demand parking is in this immediate area. Uh, I hear you about the, the garage. From our, what, from what we've looked at, we're not really worried that's going to depress demand below it already being like overwhelming, right? It's, it's, it's so high that I just don't see it dipping down below to like dipping. But in any event, uh, almost all of our parkers have prepaid for next year. So that actually of all of our rental income is probably the one that is most assured for this coming year, right? It's the thing that's maybe most definitive. Uh, the other two rela rental relationships, Meeting House Nursery School and uh, Congregation Shrey Shemayim have uh, ongoing contracts, so those are also pretty secured. It is the case, and I don't, <sighs> trying both to be candid and also just say, like, in the interest of maintaining good relationships with our partners, with whom we share space, and we see as being, you know, it's an economic relationship, it is a landlord-tenant relationship, but we also seek to just be in, like, to have everybody feel good about being connected with each other, right? It's more than just a dollars and cents thing. I don't love talking into the details about like, we're talking with this particular group about renting this particular space and this is the extra money. Like, eh, you know, I'm being a little bit vague, but yes, it is the case that we have been in negotiation with one of those renters about some additional space they would like access to. Uh, the ink is not on the paper. If the question is, have, do we have a signed contract for that additional space? The answer is no. If it's going to happen, and I have every reason to believe that it will, it will happen literally in the next like two weeks. It's just a matter of timetables with the other organization. So that, that money is anticipated in this budget, and almost every year there is rental money that is anticipated but not signed on the dotted line about. You know, that's, you, can, uh, you have every right to feel however you feel about it. I just want to be clear that it's not unusual. Great, thank you. Um, my last part of that question is, um, there's a lot of staff cuts. Yes. I, I spend most of my 
time here in the religious education area, so I'm very aware of the staff cuts that are going to happen there and what we're trying to do to mitigate some of that. Mm -hmm. Have the staff, um, what have the staff said about whether or not they're going to be able to meet the uh, expectations that we have at, for the average membership, I guess, expectations, given the cuts and the lower amount of bodies that we will have to be trying to provide all of those services? No, it's a fair question. Um, I could not and so will not try to speak with a universal voice on behalf of the entire staff team, especially because the present staff team, right, the people who are currently staff of this congregation, they are employed by this congregation, they serve this congregation, and, and I feel that we all have a, a, a pretty deep obligation of gratitude to them. The current staff team includes three people who will not be on the current staff, will not be members on the staff team, uh, or it is anticipated will not be members of the staff team, team come July, right? And so characterizing the entire team would have to take into account the honest voices of people who are losing their jobs. And that's extremely painful and difficult. And I, again, just don't feel I should or can try to speak for them. Uh, Kelly and I, as the heads of your staff team, uh, feel that this plan is achievable. It is very ambitious. I do not want to sugarcoat that. It is achievable um, and is achievable with the bulk of the heightened expectations going to us. That's something we feel very strongly about as leaders of the team. If we're going to ask more of the team, the bulk at least of those expectations need to be on us as its leaders. Uh, there are, and want to be candid, uh, going to be some increased expectations on the staff team as a whole, like we'll have to pull together in certain areas to accomplish things. My goal is to mitigate that with increased volunteer support in some areas, uh, the very small now but meaningful addition of this half-time office assistant position. Part of the reason that was envisioned was to address an area that the staff team was already like over functioning doing a bunch of work that was in nobody's job description because we had there historically there was an office manager position here but when that the person who last held that position left they weren't replaced right so part of the vision with the office assistant position was to start addressing an area where more was being expected of the staff in terms of their job performance but there was not any any additional support to go along with it uh, and then in some cases, doing less. That is part of the plan, is that there will have to be some areas in which uh, we will do less. I am working very hard and pretty optimistic about keeping that contoured away from the most essential functions and what I might call the most reasonable expectations of the staff team. Um, but that is also something we are going to have to discover together. Right When the office manager position was eliminated, this was right it was right before I arrived. It was like literally months before I arrived. Um, that was kind of an experiment. We were sort of seeing, well, can we manage without someone holding this portfolio of administrative support? Our conclusion after th almost three years is no, right? So uh, every staff change, although this is driven by necessity fundamentally, is also an experiment. I am prepared for the outcome where the answer to the experiment is, no, we need to figure something else out, right? Not, don't have the ability to make up money, but we have the ability to move things around strategically. Um, but it is, uh, in my opinion, again, as co-leader of your staff team, uh, the best strategy I have for a budget within our means at this time. I sense that everybody is getting tired, <laughs> but I hope, you, I hope you'll bear with me. There, there are two things, uh, my name is Vicki Jones. Um, there are two things that I feel we're missing from this process that I would like the, the, new, the incoming board to think about this for next year's budget. Um, one is just as we began this meeting by reviewing the congregational covenants, I would like to begin budget meetings with a review of our mission and vision and helping helping the congregation connect the dots between the proposed expenditures 
and what we care about. Um, I, I didn't see that anywhere in this process, in, in the meetings that I, that I attended. Um, the second thing is, um, in the email that went out from the board about the revised budget, it talked about how the budget recommendations were reached. Um, it talked about how um, uh, th our leaders looked at other congregations like ours, organizations like ours, looked at the staff and their personalities. What was missing in there was the voice of our congregation. And um, yes, we did some mission and vision work a little while ago, but, but our policy, our, our, the FUS policy manual calls for us to do deep discernment work with the congregation to find out what is most important to us and how we mean to live out our values. An example is social justice. Another example is religious education. Um, how does our vision translate into the various operations and programs around First Unitarian Society, and we have not done that deep discernment work for quite some time. And, um, and I hope that the board will undertake something like that so that it is better informed as to what is most important to the congregation about how we need to spend our money and our time and our heart, and also what we need to be challenged to do as a community. Thank you. My name is Clara Box, and I'm very happy. To the, oh, just continue, it's very short. Um, Kelly, I was very happy to hear you talk about volunteer help. Um, I think that a healthy congregation, a loving congregation, is supported by us being a part of the, the help that's needed. And we just need to know what we, how we can help. So thank you. Um, Sandy Eskrich, I would just like to thank this board and our current staff for the thought they've put into this. And I also appreciate all the comments and, and well-considered heartfelt um, emotions that have been shared in this last 45 minutes or so. I mean, we really all care about this place, and we really care about a lot of things, including social justice, and including religious exploration, and including all the things that we care about. And I believe that if these people and our staff believe this is the best we can do at this moment, I will proudly vote yes. Uh, Kathy Luker, um, I, I will vote yes to. I understand how the staff and the board got to the position we're in, but I agree with Barb. I don't like um, having a donation for a specific role. And I want to encourage the congregation to um, look at our values. And I'm extremely unhappy that we're losing our total social justice staff. And I'm going to ask everybody in the congregation to give more to support our values. We have reproductive justice, racial justice, um, criminal, criminal justice, and climate justice. These are our values, and we need to spend something on that. So please think about that. My name is Janice Knapp Cordes. Uh, I too would like to thank the board and the staff and all the people who created the budget this year. It must have been a lot of a lot of work and um, hmm, a certain amount of agonizing. <laughs> I would like to point out that once again we are not giving our fair share to the denomination. Uh, we didn't last year, and this year's budget 
um, is down $4,600 from last year's donation. The UUA and the regional office do so much for us. The regional office just had a conference here recently, and our president came to speak to us. Nationally, the UUA provides us with fair share compensation guidelines, with curricula, with all kinds of help for social justice work. Uh, I could go on and on. Personally, I like to um, fulfill my commitments, my obligations. I like to pay my fair shares. So this giving to the denomination is really important to me. I would suggest that the board and all of us keep this in mind for next year when we're working on the budget or deciding what our, our pledge is going to be because we are part of a national and a regional um, organization and we should step up and pay our fair share. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Christy Sprague. I'm the social justice coordinator. And um, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for showing up today and for talking about the social justice program. And I wanna thank um, Kelly AJ for being so transparent about how programs have been funded. And for all of you for thinking so hard about the budget. Um, some really difficult decisions and you know of course i'm not going to be here to see how things will play out um but i do ask you to as kathy said really show up and volunteer this upcoming year and um do that good fundraising and hopefully bring another coordinator for so for the social justice program back um yeah, the UU is founded in social justice. And I think it is so important to remember that and to put um, energy behind that. So please do show up. And, um, and I think I love our music program and I, I believe in music and art and poetry as a gateway to social justice for a lot of people. So definitely show up for that too. Um, I, I hate to see like um, positions needing to fundraise for their own program. I did not do that. I didn't know it was even a possibility. Um, so, I really love you guys. Thank you. Hi, I'm Don Van Scotter. Um, I'd like for clarity for someone to list the positions, staff positions that are being reduced or eliminated. I'm confused on that issue. Uh, so the current plan that's before the congregation uh, is simplifying in that there are no, there are no uh, like positions that exist and are being reduced in hours, right? The, again, the plan from January did have that. This, this is simpler than that. Um, there's one new position, half-time, office assistant, three full-time positions uh, being lost. That's the communications position, the social justice coordinator position, and the position entitled program assistant, which is roughly 80% children's religious exploration, 20% membership support. Those are the three positions. My name is Nancy Vetter Schultz, and my heart is breaking I mean, we, we are such a loving, beloved community. And I think that, that we really all want this congregation to be functional and to do good work in the world and to do good work for ourselves and supporting and uplifting us. And I think that really 
The problem is not so much we need to get money for this, we get, need to get money for that, we need to get money for the third thing. I think that there was a problem in the process and the congregation somehow, and I understand it would be very difficult to change this process, and I think that the, the ideas about the budget should come from the staff at the top and the board. However, we didn't get, we didn't have input soon enough. And if we had had input earlier before we were confronted with a budget, I think we wouldn't have a lot of these acrimonious discussions. We would all be feeling better about the very difficult process that we're in the middle of making choices about. So in the future, I think we need to figure out a way of not coming to us just with a budget, but with maybe more ideas about how a budget can be structured so that we don't have acrimony, because really, we love each other. We love this congregation, and we want it to work. I think we have one more online. It's me again. <laughs> um, I just wanted to remind people, because I think sometimes people just don't know, and nobody brings it up, but all of the treats that are put out after service that go with the coffee. Sometimes they're left over and extra from other events, but a lot of times they're being purchased out of a budget category. I don't know which one, but if we all just maybe brought a treat, there would be plenty for everyone and we wouldn't have to be taking money out of like, I don't know where it comes from, but from fellowship or membership or or things like that, it's it's not that hard. You don't even have to bake the cookies. You just go buy the cookies and they don't have to be fresh. Most of it's day old bakery anyways. So I just feel like last year I said, get your ass out of your seat and get volunteering. And this year I'm saying, bring some cookies. Thank you, getting down to the nuts and bolts. <laughs> okay, we do have a motion on the floor. So we're gonna take our vote now. Um, if you're online, uh, make sure you're on camera and raise your hands when we call for the vote. Um, I might have folks raise their hands in the room too, just in case as you're, as you're voting, okay? So if you are in favor of the budget, say aye and raise your hand, please. Aye. And just keep them up until we know it, everybody. And just put yourself, if you can um, put your video on if possible, if you are on Zoom. Okay, you can, you can lower your hands. Nay votes, please say nay and raise your hand. And online too. And abstentions. Abstentions online, if you could raise your hand. And keep them up. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So we have come to the close of this meeting. The work of democratic praxis, the process of governing ourselves, not being answerable to some authority exterior to this community, is actually the origin of our faith. In Unitarian Universalism, faith proceeds from practice, not the other way around. Thank you for your presence here today, here both 
literally and metaphorically. Thank you for your hard work, your deep intention, your willingness and determination to stay in relationship. There is much work to be done. Let us do it together and let us proceed with this blessing from our Unitarian Universalist ancestor, May Sarton. Help us to be the always hopeful gardeners of the spirit who know that without darkness, nothing comes to birth as without light, nothing flowers. May peace go with you from this place. Thank you, friends.